Hi, my name is Alan Xu, and I've been working as an engineer at National Instruments since 2005. Since then, I've been working with LabVIEW, LabVIEW FPGA, and many other NI products on a daily basis. I've worked on many customer applications and a wide variety of them in my time as an applications engineer. And now I'm a course development engineer, so I use that experience and knowledge to create courses for engineers and scientists like you to become proficient at our tools so you can go out there and create successful applications. Today what I'll be doing is I'll be going through the LabVIEW FPGA self-paced online training. And in this course, you will be able to learn how to harness the power, the performance, the speed, and reliability of FPGAs. So if you are using an FPGA and want to take advantage of that on a LabVIEW FPGA target, then this is the right course for you. So in the classroom version of this course, students will use a Compact Rio, a 9074. They'll use a 9211 thermal couple module, a 9234 analog input module, and a 9263 analog output module. And these will interface with a sound and vibration signal simulator, which has a balanced fan and an unbalanced fan. So in this course, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and demo these exercises for you. And uh, you can follow along in the exercise manual and create the same exact uh, VIs and FPGA VIs. However, if you do not have hardware, then you won't be able to run them, but you'll still be able to get the experience of actually developing them in the LabVIEW FPGA environment. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the LabVIEW FPGA self-paced online training course. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the benefits of FPGA technology. Here we have the roadmap for this course. So in lesson one, we'll start off by just having a quick introduction to FPGA technology in general and also LabVIEW FPGA. In lesson two, we'll start getting started with the LabVIEW FPGA environment. So we'll talk about setting up your hardware and uh, just getting started. And lesson three, we're going to dive into the LabVIEW FPGA development environment a little more and just talk about general programming principles. In Lesson 4, we'll talk about using I.O. with your FPGA. Lesson 5, we'll continue by talking about how to time your FPGA VI. In Lesson 6, we'll talk about executing code within a single clock cycle. And then in Lesson 7, we'll talk about signal processing. So here we'll talk about how do you implement uh, algorithms on your FPGA and best practices for that. Lesson 8, we'll talk about how to share data on your FPGA between multiple loops. In Lesson 9, we'll talk about how to synchronize FPGA loops and also I.O. if necessary. In Lesson 10, we'll talk about modular programming, so here we'll talk about uh, best practices for using sub-VIs on FPGAs. In Lesson 11, we're going to bring everything together and we're going to talk about how do you communicate between your FPGA that you've written and also the host VI. So here we have the course goals. So this course is going to prepare you how to select and configure uh, NI reconfigurable I.O. or RIO hardware. We'll also talk about how to create, compile, and download uh, LabVIEW FPGA VI onto your NI Rio hardware. We'll talk about performing measurements, uh, both analog and digital, and doing uh, different types of I.O. with your FPGA. We'll also talk about creating a host computer program so that you can uh, interact with your FPGA VIs from another computer. We'll also talk about controlling timing, synchronizing operations, and also implementing signal processing algorithms on your FPGA. We'll also talk about designing and implementing applications using your LabVIEW FPGA module. So we'll talk about how to use the LabVIEW FPGA environment to uh, create FPGA applications. In lesson one, we have the introduction to the LabVIEW FPGA. So we'll start off by having an introduction to FPGA technology in general. We'll also talk about the different components of a LabVIEW FPGA system. We'll compare it with a DAC-MX system so you can see the differences between the two. And we'll finish off by giving a couple examples of LabVIEW FPGA applications. So what is an FPGA? An FPGA is a field programmable gate array. Uh, one way of thinking about it is it's a programmable silicon chip. So what you can do is on software, you can define the functionality of what you want that FPGA to execute. And um, once you've done that, you can send that to your FPGA. And then the FPGA will actually rewire its own hardware to implement that functionality that you defined in software. Uh, one awesome thing about FPGAs is you, it allows the user to define and redefine functionality. So you can update the functionality of the hardware on that FPGA chip. So how exactly does an FPGA work? So you, you can define the functionality of your FPGA through software, but if we take a look at the FPGA chip, let's take a look at some hardware components that are on there. So on your FPGA chip, one thing you see is logic blocks. The logic blocks those, uh, those are the things that are able to perform the logic functions. So, uh, for example, calculations, processing, and things like that. 
Another thing that's on this chip is programmable interconnects. And what these do is they are able to connect different logic blocks together to implement your functionality. You also see I.O. blocks on there. So the programmable interconnects can also connect things to I.O. blocks, and that's the way of an FPGA being able to get input and output signals um, into and out of the FPGA. So as you can see, the FPGA, uh, there's no operating system on it. The FPGA is just, just hardware. So when you're implementing something on the FPGA, it's going to be very reliable and, um, and, and very fast. When is an FPGA used? So because FPGA is implemented in hardware and it's essentially custom hardware, it's going to have very fast I.O. response times and specialized functionality. So you can create customized triggers, customized protocols, and things like that. Another way of creating custom hardware is an ASIC, which is an application-specific integrated circuit. However, if uh, people go in this route, uh, there's going to be a high price and, high, uh, and a long time to develop it. So there's a lot of overhead that, that goes into creating an ASIC. Uh, you'll have to design the chip, then you'll have to send it off to a fabrication facility. And this could make sense if you're doing thousands of, if you're trying to create thousands of chips. However, sometimes you want to be able to rapidly prototype, and you don't want to go, you want to be able to skip the fabrication process of an ASIC design. And that's where, in, where you can use an FPGA. And designing an FPGA, you're going to have much faster prototyping times um, because you don't have to go through the fabrication process. You'll also be able to implement custom functionality with the reliability of dedicated deterministic hardware. Because an FPGA is implemented on hardware, it's going to be very reliable. Also, another thing that is really beneficial with FPGAs is it's field upgradable after deployment. If you have an ASIC, once you've created it, you're not going to be able to change its functionality. However, with an FPGA, what you can do is if you implement an FPGA with a certain, a certain algorithm on it, then later on, if you need to update that algorithm, you can go ahead and take that FPGA and then just reprogram it to have that new algorithm on your hardware. So what are the benefits of an FPGA? So one, it's flexibility. You can reconfigure it through software and upgrade it at any moment. Also, you're going to have true parallel processing. Uh, because it's implemented in hardware, you can have simultaneous parallel circuits executing at the same time. Uh, there is no CPU to share because there is no OS. Also, it's going to be very high performance. Uh, you're going to get very fast speeds. Also, it's going to be reliable, just like we talked about earlier. And you can also use it to offload processing from your CPU. If your host is using algorithms that are very CPU intensive and you want to offload some of that, you can place that onto the FPGA chip instead. Also, again, you can save costs by using an FPGA because you don't have to go through the high cost of developing an ASIC. In this section, I gave you a really quick overview of FPGA technology. If you want to find out more about FPGA technology and the benefits of it, you can go to ni.com slash FPGA for more detailed information. Now you can describe the benefits of FPGA technology. Next, we will describe the components of a LiveView FPGA system. In the previous section, we described the benefits of FPGA technology. By the end of this module, you will be able to describe the components of a LiveView FPGA system. In this slide, we see the components of a LiveView FPGA system. So one piece is the reconfigurable I.O. or RIO hardware. Another piece is the NIRIO driver, which is the driver to communicate between the hardware and the software. And you have the LiveView FPGA module as well. And the LiveView FPGA module is the develop environment that you're going to be able to use to program the functionality of your FPGA. So the LiveView FPGA module is an add-on module for LiveView. Using the LiveView FPGA module, you will be able to develop VIs that will be able to execute on your FPGA target. You can also develop VIs for your host PC or uh, real-time target to interact with the FPGA as well. In this slide, we see some examples of LiveView FPGA targets. All of these targets shown here have a user programmable FPGA that you can program. The Combat Rio over there on the left is an embedded system that runs a real-time operating system and contains an FPGA. It's very rugged and it has a wide variety of I.O. modules available. Below it, you see there is a single board Rio, and this is the board version of the Compact Rio. As you can see here, the Compact Rio has a rugged enclosure. Uh, the single board Rio, however, is just the board. At the top middle, you see R series multifunction Rio boards. These R series boards come in PCI and PXI form factors. You can use R series boards to use FPGAs on a PC or PXI system. R series boards have analog and digital I.O. On the right-hand side, you see the embedded vision system. 
This is a rugged system that offers connectivity to industrial cameras and also has a user programmable FPGA. Also, at the bottom you see there is a real instruments. Some of NI's instruments also have a FPGA that you can use to implement complex and high-speed signal processing and analysis tasks on the FPGA. And at the middle bottom you see there is a FlexRio. The FlexRio product family provides flexible, customizable I.O. FlexRio instruments consist of FPGA boards and adapter modules that provide high-performance analog and digital I.O. The adapter modules are interchangeable and define the I.O. that's available. So this LabVIEW FPGA course focuses on LabVIEW FPGA programming techniques uh, for Compact Rio, Single Board Rio, and R-Series applications. If you're using FlexRio, you will typically need additional learning beyond this course because of the much faster I.O. rates and requirements in FlexRio applications. FlexRio techniques are covered in more detail in the High Throughput LabVIEW FPGA course and FlexRio course. So how does LabVIEW FPGA work? First, you will create a LabVIEW FPGA VI. When you run it, your VI will automatically be translated into VHDL code. Then industry standard Xilinx compiler tools are invoked, and the VHDL code is optimized and synthesized into a hardware circuit realization of your LabVIEW FPGA VI. This process also applies timing constraints and tries to achieve an efficient use of FPGA resources. The result of the Xilinx compiler tools is a bit file, which contains instructions on how to configure the FPGA circuit. LabVIEW then loads the bit file to the FPGA chip to configure it to execute what you originally programmed in your LabVIEW FPGA VI. So what are the benefits of a LabVIEW FPGA system? One, you get to leverage the FPGA technology. Also, you won't have to learn Verilog or VHDL coding or board design. You can just do it in LabVIEW. With FPGA, you can have onboard decision making, so everything is being done in the hardware. You have direct access to the hardware terminals as well. In LabVIEW FPGA, you have an extensive library of built-in functions at your disposal already, such as PID and different things like that. You can also use it to integrate with third-party IP. So you can use certain nodes to get a VHDL code to go inside your, uh, inside your LabVIEW FPGA VI. You also have tools to communicate, monitor, and control the FPGA from a Windows PC or real-time controller. So not only can you program the FPGA, you'll also be able to have a host VI that can communicate with it. In the previous section, we described the components of a LabVIEW FPGA system. By the end of this module, you will be able to describe the differences between a LabVIEW FPGA system and an NIDAC MX system. To understand the paradigm of a LabVIEW FPGA system, it's important to understand the specific components found in a traditional measurement system. So here, we have a NIDAC MX system, and if we take a look at it, uh, we see that the M-series device, that's vendor-defined, right? Then this is a piece of hardware that you, you're not defining the functionality of the hardware. Uh, this is something that the vendor, namely National Instruments, in this case, has provided to you already. There's also a driver, so you see the NIDAC MX driver, and this is also vendor-defined. It's the way that your hardware communicates with your software. And then what you do get to define in this case is, is your LabVIEW VI. So here you're, you're, you're able to define the software that executes on the host PC. So if we take a look at the LabVIEW FPGA system, let's kind of contrast that. So let's take a look at the hardware side first, okay, on, on the right side of the slide. So the real hardware that you're buying, uh, of course, some of it is going to be vendor defined. However, because you're able to actually program the FPGA chip, which is hardware that exists on the real hardware, you're actually able to define uh, the functionality of the hardware itself. Now, if you take a look at the software side, there's still a vendor defined NI Rio driver to communicate between the hardware and the software. Um, but you can also, again, define something on the host side. So on the host PC side, you can create uh, and, and define how that host program works and how that host program is going to communicate with your customized hardware that you're also defining the logic of on your hardware. In this slide, we see how decision making is done in software. So if you look at a traditional system, notice that you've got your, you, you've got your UUT, your unit under test, and you have, your, you have all these layers between the, the hardware and the actual calculation. So if you take a look at it, you've got your UUT there, and it's got to go through an I.O. layer, then it has to run on an operating system, and then it has to go through a driver API, and then your application software, which you're defining the calculation on. Now, if you're running this, a crash can, can occur either at the OS level, at the API level, and also at the application software level. 
So there's several places for a crash to, to occur. Also, um, if you're running this on a Windows OS, uh, you're going to get response times in the range of milliseconds. Uh, if you're running it on a real-time OS, it, you get some better performance. You can get things in the range of microseconds. However, there's a lot of, because both of them are running on OSs, uh, there are many places for that crash to occur. So here we contrast that with decision making in hardware. So if you're looking at a live FPGA system, uh, you've got that same unit under test. Um, however, that I.O. is going straight to your FPGA, which is, uh, which is implemented in hardware. So if you look at this, all that calculation is being done on the hardware. And you notice that the operating system, the driver API, and the application software are not involved at all. So here we see that we can have the highest amount of reliability, and also you get, um, you, you get to execute things in the range of nanoseconds instead. So it's much faster and very reliable. Here we see a couple of examples of LabVIEW FPGA applications. So uh, one thing you can use FPGA for is intelligent DAC. So if you're using FPGA, you can have customized timing. Um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can get faster speeds and synchronization. You can create custom triggers um, that, that can trigger off of multiple lines, analog and digital. You can also have a lot of custom counters. So you, you can implement that counting however you want because you're defining that in hardware. You can also have multiple scan rates. So for example, you can have uh, multiple rates getting analog input, but you can have each of those loops running at a different rate. Also, because it's FPGA, you get ultra high speed control, so you can get things in the range of nanoseconds. Because you have fast speed, you can have specialized communication protocols that you implement. Also, if your host computer is spending a lot of time and, and, and has a lot of CPU intensive processing, you can move that down to the FPGA, so that way the CPU isn't as taxed. Also, uh, complex timing and synchronization, those are all possible on FPGAs. And another use case is doing hardware in the loop testing. So because of the reliability and speeds of FPGA and the, the determinism of it, you can also simulate things like sensors or protocols and things like that by doing HIL testing. Now you can describe the differences between a LabVIEW FPGA system and an NIDAC MX system. Next, we will describe the LabVIEW FPGA architecture on Windows and LabVIEW FPGA architecture with LabVIEW Real-Time.